It's great to be here. Good afternoon. Thanks to the Dallas Architecture Forum for inviting me. It's great to be back at the Nasher with my friend Jeremy, who, uh, who hailed with us in Los Angeles for many years. And we've been working with Steve Nash at the Palm Springs Art Museum now. I'm on the Board of Trustees there. So it's been wonderful to have Steve with us in Palm Springs near Los Angeles. And so it feels like coming home a bit when I come to Dallas. <laughs> this afternoon, what I'd like to explore is the crisis of modern preservation. It sounds so ominous. Um, but we'll also explore some of our work and some other preservation issues. And I look forward to your questions later in the program today. I'm from Los Angeles. Our office uh, is a Los Angeles-based office. Uh, we started in 1989. This is our current office. And we have about 120 employees uh, on the architecture and design side of our office. Uh, we have three senior associates and four associates who work very closely with Ron Radziner and myself um, at the office. We have been greatly influenced by the Bauhaus. Uh, the ideas and the notions that were studied at that time were, we believe are still very relevant for us today. And in many ways what the Bauhaus sought to do was to blur the line between artist and craftsperson. And in the same way our office tries to blur the line between architect and builder. We feel many connections to the history uh, of this institution. And when you look at that group of people, it is a who's who of modern thought. It's incredibly intimidating. Uh, Joseph Albers, Henrik Shepard, George Moosch, uh, Laszlo maholy Nage, Herbert Beyer, Mr. Schmidt, Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, Vasily Kandinsky, Dinsky, Paul Klee, Leonel Feininger, Schlemmer. I, I mean, it's just the, the Bauhaus brought together modern thinkers in the 20s. And as part of that tradition, our office is very interested in the, the broad range of design. So we are architects, we are interior designers, we do landscape design, and we're also general contractors. And within that tradition of construction, we also have a metal shop and a cabinet shop to support both our construction services as well as the construction operations of other general contractors. So it's a very odd mix of individuals with many different backgrounds. But what's really stimulating and fun about that is that we get to be involved in many different aspects. We do a great deal of furniture design. Uh, we've recently started to um, engage in jewelry design. And so we, with our our shop have begun to develop lines of jewelry. We sell jewelry and one of the things I really love about the jewelry is that it's so much more accessible than architecture. It's so much... <laughs> <laughs> architecture uh, in this day and age, it's hard to think of it as, as a sport for the masses. Unfortunately, architecture has become a, a very rarefied um, experience, uh, really uh, experienced by very few within our country and the world. Uh, so things like jewelry and housewares, uh, it, it gives us a chance to kind of spread the thinking, spread the conversation to more people. Um, and I always say it's not too early to get the Marmol Radziner menorah that's on the bottom of that page. So <laughs> they, I will say last year they sold out. So I'm giving you a warning if you want one. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about the restoration work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna warn you because I, I tend to wander around and I'm going to fall off this stage. So when that happens, just try to bear with me in the dignity of getting back up here. Uh, the Kaufman House, Palm Springs, uh, designed by Richard Neutra in 1946. And really in many ways this is the seminal California experience of modern architecture. It had been altered extensively. It had doubled in size. All of the finishes and fixtures had been lost. And so our job was really to academically bring this back to what it was. There was an incredible amount of research that went into this project uh, in terms of studying uh, historic materials, all 
all of the documentation that we could gather from UCLA archives, from the Kaufman uh, archive in New York, um, and, and really bringing together as much information as we possibly could. There was also a great deal of, of research on materials. And I will say, we did this project and started this project in 1993. And we finished it in 1998. And it's always so interesting to me that people are interested in this project as though we finished it recently. For us, this is ancient history. When we started working on this project, there was no interest in modern architecture, especially in Palm Springs. There was no curiosity. It was too new, and we'll talk more about that. So we had the opportunity to study the notion of how do we remake, how do we uh, reimagine, how do we re-engage material of the modern era in a way that is useful for us today. And, and many of the machine-made products of the 1940s and 50s, of course, are no longer made today many times for very good reason. And so we had to go back and figure out how do we remake materials, um, like for example, this crimped sheet metal, which Neutra used extensively on many of his projects. Um, it's no longer made today. How do we make it today? And believe me, at the time, there was no one willing to make this stuff um, because it took machining and, and creating um, uh, the machines to do something for for a relatively small amount of material. So these were the kinds of challenges that um, we faced. And we went so far as to coerce, cajole, coerce is not the right word, right? Cajole, encourage a mine in Utah to <laughs> allow us to excavate in an area of the mine that was being excavated in the 1940s so we could literally pull the same sandstone out of the quarry that Neutra was pulling out in the 1940s. 40s. So that was kind of the extent to which this home was academically restored. And, and out of that process came for us a real, um, I think, commitment to modern design, a real curiosity, a learning opportunity, and through it all, asking ourselves the question, how do we take modern historical artifacts that have worn through time and make them viable and useful, not by the standards of 1946, because trust me, none of you want to live in a modern home from 1946. It would not meet your needs. How do we make it viable for these homes to be used in today's context? So, um, again, ancient history, and out of this project, um, we've now done probably 30 or more modern restorations in the Los Angeles Basin with literally every historically significant modern architect that practiced um, in, in the community of Los Angeles, in the basin of Los Angeles. We also had the opportunity to design a new structure. This is the pool house uh, adjacent to the Kaufman House. House. And if there's anything really horrifying for an architect, especially at the time a young architect, um, to do is to put a new building near something like the Kaufman House. It's a it's a horrifying um, opportunity. And so really the goal was to be compatible and responsive to the historic house without mimicking it, without trying to in imitate it. Um, certainly we could never achieve anything um, coming close to the level of sophistication that the Kaufman House expressed. So in many ways it's a background building, it's a, a frame building to look back at the historic house. And so in that 30 plus restorations, um, I'll, I'll just show you a couple very quickly. This is uh, what is affectionately known as the Rainbow House, also uh, actually known as the Garcia House. And um, this, is, this is John Lautner. And what's incredible about John Lautner is this, in, this expressive sculptural quality that these homes have. Yet, there's just a delicacy to this. There's a transparency to this, um, which is really beautiful to sit here and look at. Really 
difficult to restore when so many, uh, so many of the problems in this structure have to do with water intrusion and air and wind that blows through your main living room. Uh, and, and many of our tasks are really incredibly dull and boring and um, kind of about how do we keep the character and the grace of this structure and at the same time again make it comfortable and integrate such things as sub-zero refrigerators and new cooktops and the like and those are in this structure we have changed this structure to accommodate those conveniences of our contemporary life is that acceptable from a preservation perspective Whoop. Um, this is Palm Springs. This is the Harvey House, Buff and Hensman, 1969. Uh, so a different kind of architectural expression, still modern, still, you, you still feel that transparency, that connection to the exterior, the power of the structural system, the regularity and the predictability of the structural system. Uh, and so here, um, once again, we had the opportunity to take this historic house and really um, refresh it, bring it up to current standard, and, and really in a lot of ways have a lot of fun with the finishes and the textures and the interiors and the artwork. And so these kinds of projects are very near and dear to our heart. Um, we enjoy them greatly. Um, and and we're, we're always engaged in a couple of these kinds of um, projects. So, so let's turn for a moment to the broader conversation about modern pro preservation. And we have to, in some way, as a preservation community, come to grips with this chart. And what this chart says is after the World Wars, there was an incredible spike in construction. But after World War II, there was an unprecedented growth, an explosion of construction following that war. This was, this was never before seen in the United States, this level of industrialized production after the World War. Um, and what's happening now is this body of work is crossing the magic 50-year threshold. Now, 50 years is arbitrary but that happens to be the threshold that has been established by the National Register of Historic Places to say a historic building or any building is eligible for recognition for its historical character. Now, Doko Momo, who's active here in um, Dallas uh, and all over the world, um, Doko Momo um, characterizes this as a crisis of modernism. And I'm going to just read from them. I'm just going to read a couple things today, so bear with me because it's so good. Um, Doko Momo wrote about this crisis. And what they said is in the last decades, the architectural heritage of the modern movement appeared more at risk than during any other period. This built inheritance glorifies the dynamic spirit of the machine age. At the end of the 1980s, many modern masterpieces had already been demolished or changed beyond recognition. This was mainly due to the fact that many were not considered to be elements of heritage. That is, many were not old enough that their original functions have substantially changed. Again, our expectations have changed about these buildings. And their technological innovations have not always endured long-term stresses. They leak, water comes in, the materials are rotting away. They're not necessarily performing very well in today's climate. So 
we stand at this threshold, this kind of um, moment, and and this happens to be Palm Springs, so Los Angeles Basin. We're not alone. I, I mean, you certainly have experienced your losses as well. Every city is right now facing this challenge. So the question for us, if we're interested in preservation, is what do we do about it? How do we respond? How do we, once we recognize the challenge, what do we as a community of preservationists do? So um, before we answer that, uh, let's have some fun. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about Los Angeles and Dallas. And, you know, let's be honest. We all love to malign Los Angeles, right? Smog, congestion, riots, gangs, public schools, O.J. Simpson, the Kings, the Lakers, the Dodgers, our beloved Kardashians. It goes on and on and on. Yet somehow, in that cultural chaos, we also produce the likes of Mr. Schindler, um, who built his own house in the 1920s, Mr. Neutra, uh, in this case the Lovell House, 1929, one of the most significant residential structures of that era. Mr. Neutra also built his own house in Silver Lake, uh, a suburb of Los Angeles. The Eameses practiced in Los Angeles, they built their home in Los Angeles, the, um, the list of significant modern practitioners in Los Angeles is too lengthy to even waste our time with. There is a, a, an incredible history of modernism in the LA Basin. So we have to ask ourselves why? Well certainly it begins with the climate. We have in Los Angeles an incredibly um, hospitable uh, place to live. That is, when you think about the modern notion of connecting the interior space with the exterior space, what better laboratory than the California desert? Um, so the climate played a tremendous role in developing mid-century modern thinking that we all have in our minds. But it goes beyond the climate. We have to talk about our um, our industrial base. Our industrial base had to do with manufacturing. So we were producing the products and materials and systems that intrigued modern designers. And it was being done in Los Angeles. We also had Hollywood. And Hollywood uh, produced a client that is incredibly extroverted. Right? When you're in Hollywood, you want in fact, you don't just want to be seen, you need to be seen if you intend to survive in Hollywood. So it's a different kind of wealth based, tends to be younger and more extroverted, which drove modern opportunities. Now we also had this, um, this sprawl city, um, but we, um, along with that, had a university in the University of Southern California that was the, the real kind of mecca of modern thinking at that time. In California there were two schools. There was USC and there was Berkeley. Berkeley was in the Beaux-Arts tradition. So after the war, when the modernists came back from the war, and many of the names I've been talking about, served in the war, came back, obtained the GI Bill, and went to USC uh, to study. We also had a, um, and, and yes, I'm going to get to Dallas. Um, it's just there's so much to talk about with Los Angeles when it comes to modern culture. Um, we had a publications uh, uh, kind of environment that centered around arts and architecture, John Intenza's program, uh, and he developed the case study program. The case study program, we, we can all accept no matter where we're from in the U.S., the case study program had an incredible impact in our thinking about modern design. So John Intenza and the case study program, but that's not enough to say because John Intenza needs needed images. And Los Angeles had Julius Shulman who was producing images like this that didn't just pique the curiosity of the world. This image constructed the world's view about what it is to be modern. It's, it's about structural um, uh, kind of 
uh, aggressiveness and expression. It's about openness. It's about this kind of simple, seamless quality. It's also about this kind of sexy, madman lifestyle that we're going to talk more about, because uh, I know that's the only reason you all came. Um, <laughs> but we had, we also had Julia Shulman to, to, like I said, we had Julia Shulman to, to kind of create that. So Julia Shulman, who's on the left, because that's Mr. Neutra on the right, uh, Julia Shulman created, he constructed the modern vision that you and I know. It wasn't there out in the ether. Julia Shulman made it for us, like any practicing artist. What artists do is they carve out a frame and that frame allows the rest of us who aren't engaged in that view a, a peek at some insight into a perspective on the world. So that's what Julius Shulman gave us. So let's talk uh, for a minute about Dallas. Um, <laughs> Dallas is part of the Sun Belt culture. Dallas developed in the same way that Los Angeles did as a sprawl city. That is, like Los Angeles, Dallas is not encumbered by some kind of geographical constraint, the way, say, San Francisco is, where they have the bay. So water is a great constraint to development, even though they filled in a bunch of the bay to kind of cheat the edge a bit. Generally, water keeps us from, from kind of continuing to expand, or mountains or other physical constraints. Dallas, like Los Angeles, was, was able to spread out. That created great opportunities. It also created, created some urban challenges. But Dallas really did become invested in modern thinking. Um, and part of that is the great economic boom that Dallas experienced after the World War. So you see in the history of Dallas, architects like Welton Beckett practicing uh, in the late 70s uh, within your city. Um, of course, Philip Johnson practiced here in Texas, or did, did a great deal of work here in Texas. Um, we also had I.M. Pei, uh, whose firm exists today, uh, and so I.M. Pei also um, did a great deal of work here. So you have notable architects who are coming here because of the economic opportunities and a development mentality that was booming at the time. And, and that continues today. So today, um, in other t uh, Texas-based cities, uh, we have the likes of Tadao Ando, so Japanese influence coming to the state of Texas to work. And of course, we have the God himself. Um, there, there's, uh, you know, there, there's a, I can, don't worry, I won't, but I can talk for days <laughs> on the impact that this man had on my own personal life and career, but also on, on all of our perceptions of what modernism is today. And so here in Fort Worth, he did one of his seminal works um, as a, an art gallery. And, and of course, that continues here today with Mr. Piano coming um, to uh, Dallas to continue these modern traditions. Um, so, so in Los Angeles, which was incorporated in 1850, uh, the size of the city, 469 um, square miles of land, so a relatively large city, uh, we have right now 1,091 designated historic monuments. So in the city of Los Angeles, we have 2.3 monuments per square mile. Who wants to take a guess what the, that ratio is for Dallas? Any guesses? Point one. Point one? Zero? <laughs> no, you have them. Uh, trust me. I put some up um, a moment ago. Um, you have 103 designated monuments in the city of Dallas. So you have 0.4 monuments per square mile. City roughly the same size as Los Angeles. Only six years um, less old. It, it incorporated six years after Los Angeles. So relatively same size, relatively same age. This is not a criticism at all. 
This is simply to point out that we, we have a challenge ahead of us to recognize um, monuments that exist within our communities. And it's not to say what the right answer is here. Uh, you know, how many monuments is appropriate per square mile? I will say, um, if you compare it, because we always do this, to European-based cities. You can't really compare U.S. cities to European cities because of the age issue. Like if you think about Amsterdam, the year that Amsterdam was incorporated, that is it began to take shape as a city, is far earlier than this. Now Amsterdam right now has 8,500 designated monuments within an area that's roughly the same size as San Francisco, as um, Los Angeles and Dallas. So they have 8,500. So the question isn't, should we have 8,500? The issue is, when Dallas or Los Angeles reach the same age as Amsterdam, will we have available to us 8,500 historically recognized monuments. And that's the challenge. And you have them. And there are many, and I don't need to spend a lot of time. I mean, certainly Frank Lloyd Wright practiced here. Um, you have Grayson Gill, who practiced here. Fascinating modern building, worthy of designation. You, you tell me. Um, we have uh, Pereira and Luckman practicing. You have William Tabler. Uh, you, ha you have many historically significant architects that practiced within this city. And those buildings are right now coming of age. And I'm telling you, those buildings right now are facing some real challenges when it comes to preservation. Now, of course, um, I just wouldn't feel right if I didn't talk about politics in Texas. Um, it's always a frightening thing to come from California and talk about politics in Texas. Um, but it, it's an oversimplification to say, well, California is a blue state and Texas is a red state. Uh, it, it's not really true. What you can say is there is predominant leaning towards certain political attitudes in California and in Texas, and specifically Los Angeles and Dallas. And Dallas is a lot less red than I expected when I first asked for this slide to be produced. I was expecting to see much more red um, in the slide to the left. So you see there actually a much more complicated and fascinating um, tapestry of political perspective. The only reason I bring this up is because this has a, an influence on the issue of property rights. And preservation fundamentally is a conversation about individual property rights within the United States. A country that was formed, established to escape the burden of empirical tyranny, right? We came here as a people to say, thou shalt not tread on me. So who are all these preservationists saying, I can't tear down my own damn building? What right do you have to tell me what I can and can't do on my own property? And so we have to, if we're interested in notions of preservation, struggle with that question. Do we have the right? Should we as a community stand up and say, not that building? This developer with the Century Plaza Hotel had a plan to tear down the building. They were hiring Pay Cobb Freed of the the pay tradition to design two new high-rise towers for Century City, which is a community in Los Angeles. Um, there just happened to be an old hotel in the way that needed to be raised. So this developer came to us as an office to say, um, we would like to hire you. Not as preservation architects, trust me. Um, they wanted to hire us because in California, we do, because of our politics, believe generally that there are certain property rights that should be limited. If you live on the California coastline, you better be prepared because there's a ton of regulation and burden that limits what you can do on your property. Very different than many of the Texas communities. 
So California's politic allows more public acceptance of regulation and burden on the individual property owner. So this developer wanted to tear this building down, but in California, um, to slow the process down, we have to do an environmental impact report, um, which outlines the environmental impacts. And then you have to write mitigations. Okay, you're going to make traffic worse. Okay, well, we're gonna put in some stoplights, we're gonna put in this and that, we're gonna mitigate the environmental impact of more traffic. And therefore, you should still approve the project. Well, this project, what was the environmental impact? Well, one of them was loss of historic fabric, potential historic fabric, because Los Angeles recognized that uh, Minoru Yamasaki was a, uh, a, a historically significant architect. This was a cultural monument. There were all kinds of, of events that happened at the hotel that the city and preservationists recognized as important. Um, and so we were hired to write the mitigations. Not to be the preservation architect, but simply because of the environmental impact report, um, we were hired to, to make up the mitigations and the developer said to me at the first meeting, but so help me God, Leo, don't sign our contract unless you're totally committed and you understand that we're gonna tear down this damn building. You know, you know that, right? This building is gone, and if you're not comfortable with that, don't sign our contract. And I said, you know, I, I can be comfortable with that, but just know that if you sign our contract, that we're gonna do everything we can to help you understand why it's not in your interest to tear down the building. And it opened up a conversation. So they hired us for whatever reason. Um, now, it's not, we didn't save the building. We just happened to be in the room with the developer while the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Los Angeles Conservancy started to organize. And they started to gather their forces. And they started making it clear to the developer that they were gonna make this one of their grand stands. That they were gonna draw a line in the sand and said, not this time. And the developer said, I have every right to tear it down. Legally, he, he did. He had every right to tear down this building. It wasn't a designated monument. There was nothing in the zoning code or the planning code that said you couldn't do it. It wasn't 50 years old at the time. So he had every right to tear it down. So my role and our office's role, role was simply to say, don't underestimate the power of those preservationists. They're not a bunch of tie-dye, Birkenstock wearing hippies um, out there on the California sunshine um, to fight you and your building. These are well-organized, intelligent, well-funded uh, people that are used to doing battle. I'm not sure you want to do battle because the best case scenario for you is you're going to win. <laughs> and you'll be able to tear down your building. And you will never be forgiven in the Los Angeles press for having taken this building down. So you tell me. The building that was torn down earlier from Palm Springs, the Maslin House, that was a Richard Neutra building torn down overnight on Saturday. On Friday evening, the owner pulled a demo permit from the city of Rancho Mirage. On Saturday morning, the bulldozers were there. By Saturday afternoon, the building was gone before any preservationist woke up <laughs> from bed that morning. It was gone, right? Um, so, here, in this case, that could not happen. And I will say that's one of the benefits of California preservation that you do not currently have. That you're, you have to recognize that your politic leans more toward the property rights side. And so you have a greater uphill battle than we in Los Angeles. And I'm telling you, we have a challenge in Los Angeles. So, okay, politics aside, what is it that's so important about these buildings? Um, here's the challenge, is that significance 
Whenever we're evaluating whether a building should or shouldn't be saved, significance is typically, um, or eligibility is typically weighed, weighed, evaluated on three primary criteria. Age. Is it 50 years old? That's a yes or no question. It's pretty easy to answer, right? Significance. It's actually not that hard to answer significance. Is it a notable architect? Did anything special happen there? Did George Washington eat lunch on a Saturday afternoon on the 4th of July in that particular house? We can talk about significance in a way that's pretty objective and human and easy to talk about. It's the last criteria that challenges us and that's the issue of integrity. It's a hard enough issue to struggle with outside of preservation, right? But when it comes to preservation, there's some very specific guidelines around the notion of integrity. What integrity traditionally has meant to preservationists is how much of the original building is still seen in the building. How much original historic fabric is still there. And preservationists have generally kind of weighed the fabric. Well, what's the threshold? Well, sometimes it's kind of 51%. You know, it's as though you stacked up all the bricks and the original bricks and the new bricks and the original stone and the new stone and the original and you stack them all up and if the, the scale leans a little bit toward original, it has integrity and it's a significant building worthy of designation. If it leans a little bit over, it's not quite original enough, well it doesn't have integrity, it can't be designated, and go ahead and tear it down. Well that's a, that's a very um, difficult standard to evaluate, especially when it comes to modern buildings, and here's the difference. Modern buildings are diff different than other historical styles because they're more complicated. There's fewer materials to begin with. Generally, it's not a big stack of bricks that someone put together and they're either original or they're not. It's these complex assemblies like a sliding glass door. So what's the historic part of a sliding glass door? Is it the glass? Is it the frame? It's the gasket holding the glass. No, it's the wheels holding the sliding glass door in the track. Or is it the hardware? Or is it, well, traditionally, what you say is, well, 50% of those materials, if 50% are still there, well, then it's historic. And it has to be saved. Okay, the glass isn't tempered. We'd all argue that's, worth changing, right? You're not going to keep glass that could kill your child. Right? You've got to change the glass at least. Put it on a scale, take out the glass. The glass weighs more than 50% of that sliding glass door. So changing out the glass, does it lose its integrity? Is it still historically significant because you changed the glass? Well, you get into these stupidly esoteric conversations about how to restore buildings. You know, y your goal as an architect is to keep the damn water out. Well, is it okay to change gaskets around old windows? You know, the Guggenheim faced this. Is it okay to change the door and window system? They don't operate anymore. They weigh a ton. They rusted. It's a gallery for God's sake. You know what kind of archival standards this building had to meet? The Guggenheim wasn't even close to an archival standard to allow a curator to put in a valuable piece of art into the Guggenheim. So is it okay to change out materials? I would argue that modern buildings need to be thought about a little more like conceptual art. And Sol LeWitt, um, as one of our conceptual artists, kind of coined it really nicely and said, in conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. That is, the execution is a perfunctory affair. <laughs> so how do you preserve a Sol LeWitt piece? The execution doesn't even count in Soul's mind. Um, 
modern architecture faces a very similar challenge to conceptual art. But I want to give one example of success and show that one of the opportunities we have as preservationists is to change use. <laughs> It's so simple. Um, this was a bank in the city of Palm Springs designed by Stu Williams uh, in 1960. It's this incredibly elegant modern structure um, within this, uh, what was known as the bank district of Palm Springs and the new, um, that building was right in there. The Palm Springs Art Museum is up in here. The Palm Springs Art Museum purchased this historic bank to develop an, a, a museum committed to architecture and design. There are actually very few cities in America that have standalone museums for architecture and design. Palm Springs took it upon themselves to do just that. And they chose this incredibly elegant building to do it in. Uh, the next speaker, Sydney Williams, daughter-in-law of Stu Williams, I'll tell you that, she won't. Um, she took it upon herself to find an opportunity for the museum to purchase a building to create this um, architecture and design museum and she chose uh, really an incredibly perfect, elegant, modern box. Transitioning this building from a a bank to a museum was relatively easy because of this large um, open gathering space uh, into what is now a gallery. Now, what's, what's kind of courageous about this building is that in 1960, most banks were not glass boxes open to the street. Right? Most banks, even today, are seen as heavy repositories of neoclassical permanence to keep your money safe. <laughs> it wasn't this glass box where everyone could see you transacting dollars um, on the street. It was a very courageous building for that particular bank in 1960. And so the retrofit of this bank to uh, a museum was, was actually a pretty seamless opportunity. All cities have opportunities like this to find historic modern buildings and reimagine them and repurpose them into these kinds of new uses. Whether it's a museum or some other use isn't the point. This happened to be a very uh, wonderful seamless transition. The point is that Part of what we can do with that huge repository of post-World War II buildings is to think about how to reuse them and to give them new economic life. We have to give them economic life because without that, the building will not be preserved. I'm just gonna run through these because I've been talking too long. And so these are some of our new projects. And, and I will just say that the reason I show these is simply to say that for us, preservation is not a dusty old textbook. Um, for us, preservation is an opportunity to learn from modern masters and apply those ideas to our new projects. And these new projects, what we're trying to respond to is, uh, are, are similar notions to the modernists, but using materials in, a, in an efficient way. Well, it's very sustainable to use materials in, a, in an efficient way. It's a modern idea, but sustainability is a very contemporary, current issue that we all are talking about. Um, the other issue is that, that we've been sold a bill, bill of goods that somehow uh, all this new technology is going to make your life simpler. <laughs> no one believes that anymore, right? Um, that somehow you're going to have, um, because you have so much choice available to you at your fingertips, that you're going to be happier because you're so connected. Um, in a lot of ways, our technology has bombarded us with a cacophony of opportunity and choice that is numbing at times. So in many ways, we just think of the house as a place of peace, a place of rest, and that's a very modern concept. 
Um, so the forms and expressions may be different, but the goals of these new buildings that we're doing are still fundamentally very modern. Simplify, be efficient, and as much as possible connect the interior experience to the exterior. And no matter where you are on the planet, I promise you there's something wonderful about the space outside. Even when you're in a dense urban environment, there is something amazing about what is going on outside. And we all just long to be connected to what's happening outside. We want to feel safe and quiet and, and at peace within the home, but we also want to feel a sense of community outside the home. So I think that's my last slide because it won't forward. <laughs> Thank you.